This episode is inspired by Patty, Skippy's mum. Shout out to Patty and Skippy. In the back and forth that Patty and I have had about various factors that could affect Skippy's training, I just said to Patty at one point, look, here's a really simple rule for you to follow. Does the thing that you're talking about, the, the question or the, the factor that you're wondering about, does this make Skippy's separation anxiety training outcomes better or worse? Is she more or less likely to do well if the factor that you're considering is involved? So thank you to Patty for making me think that way. And it sounds really simple, doesn't it? Just you know, ask the question, does this make it more or less likely that my dog will be successful with training? Will my dog be more successful with the training exercise I've given them if this thing happens or if this thing has occurred? So very simple, but there's quite a lot going on underpinning this really simple rule. Of course there is. But however, I think this just might be the most important thing you can ask when you're about to start a very specific separation anxiety training session. So tune into this episode to find out why I say that. Hello and welcome to the Be Right Back Separation Anxiety Podcast. Hi, I'm Julie Naismith, dog trainer, author and full-on separation anxiety geek. I've helped thousands of dogs overcome separation anxiety with my books, my online programs, my trainer certification and my separation anxiety training app. And this podcast is all about sharing my tips and tricks to help you teach your dog how to be happy at home alone too. All right, no episode would be complete or very few episodes would be complete without a really quick refresher of how separation anxiety training works. In its simplest form, we're just exposing a dog to the thing it's frightened of, alone time. But we don't do it at a scary level. We're not exposing the dog to alone time that's going to frighten the dog. We take the alone time and we just reduce it to a level that the dog can handle. And it's a technique that's called gradual exposure. And then we gradually, and there's the term, gradually, gradual, we gradually increase the amount of time the dog can handle. And we make sure that the dog is never anxious, that however much time we leave the dog for in training, so however long the duration, the dog is fine with it. So it's not hard, it's not easy. Every single time we do a training session with the dog, it should be achievable. And then we go at your dog's pace. So we only increase duration if we think a dog is going to be okay with it. Again, we don't increase the duration and make it hard. We always are cognizant of whether our dog is going to be okay. We should always be thinking, I'm going to set a target duration that a dog's going to ace. And then we don't go too far, too fast. So we just follow what our dogs can handle. We're guided by their tolerance of the training and of the alone time. So really, there's just one rule, <laughs> like keep a dog under threshold, expose it gradually to increasing intensity of alone time and don't go too far too fast. Boom. There you go. So that's separation anxiety training. We're done here, right? Well, obviously not so fast because you know, you wouldn't be listening to this podcast if you thought it was that simple because underneath that quite tight, quite straightforward rule, of course, there's lots of different things going on. As I say, otherwise you wouldn't be tuning in and you wouldn't be thinking about getting a trainer or diving into my free Facebook group or grabbing my book because you'd have the answer. Just, you know, go at your dog's pace, keep your dog under threshold, increase the amount of alone, alone time, don't go too far too fast. And the reason why I'm sure you want to know more and you're always, not always, hopefully not always thinking about separation anxiety training, but often thinking about separation anxiety training is that there are nuances. And there are very many things that are dog dependent. And I've worked with so many dogs now that I can see the depends. I can work out categories of it depends because I've seen dog after dog after dog after dog, hundreds of dogs. And I see patterns and I see patterns that lead me to conclude that, okay, so there are certain things that do affect training certain categories that affect training for the vast majority of dogs. So very dog dependent, 
that rule, we take that rule and we apply it to each dog and we answer that question. Are the things we do, are certain factors more or less likely to make a training session successful for your dog? We're talking about things that when you start the training session, when you start doing the gradual exposure training session, things that have happened before that training session that might mean your dog will absolutely smash the training or it might mean that your dog will have a really bad time in training. Now, fancy terms for this, if we want to get all dog trainery speak, we're talking about things, you might have heard of these terms called antecedents and setting events. You can think about these as broadly as things that happen before you start to train. Now, obviously there's stuff that happens while you're training that can throw everything up in the air, like the delivery person coming, like the doorbell going, like the dog barking next door. But let's think about the things that affect your training up to that point where you say, right, I've got my training plan and I'm going out of the door. Antecedents, think about antecedents as things that happen just before. So things that happen just before you start the training. Maybe it's putting on a coat because you put on your coat, it's cold. You did that just before the training. Then there are things that happen further back. So not the things you do right that moment when you're training, but things that go further back, maybe further back in the day or maybe further back in the week. And these two increase the likelihood or decrease the likelihood that your dog will do okay. They increase or decrease the likelihood that your dog will respond to your trigger of leaving. And those things that go further back, we can call them setting events. I know I said I wasn't going to get fancy, but I did. But let's forget the fancy stuff for now because we could go down a complete rabbit hole. I could do a whole podcast episode just on those concepts. All you need to think about, let's keep it simple. Just think about stuff that has bearing, that has an impact on your dog's likelihood to succeed in any given training session. That's all you need to think about. You just think about that question that I started this podcast off with. What affects your dog's chances of success? Does this make it easier or harder for your dog? Does this make it more or less likely that your dog will succeed? And every dog really is very different. But the good news is that most of these uh, things... I don't like calling it saying things because that's so broad, but these setting events and antecedents, the things that are happening beforehand, the good news is that although every dog is different, there's about a 90-10 or maybe even a 95-5 rule here in that most dogs are are affected by a smaller number of categories. So in other words, I can now tell you the sorts of things that you might want to look out for Because we see the pattern across dogs over and over and over again. Certain things seem to affect all dogs. Now, there's always outliers. You'll always get some dog who is affected by, you know, a very unique event that we've never seen any dog affected by before. Although often when we drill down, we can sort of put that event into the categories that I'm about to go through with you. But that's the beauty of watching so many dogs and training so many dogs and working with so many dog parents. I've seen over and over again the patterns of what affects the likelihood that a dog will be okay. So let's have a think about those. I'm not overcomplicating it. Let's keep it as simple as we can. I'm just going to talk about categories. So instead of talking about things, let me change my terminology and I'll talk about categories. So categories that will affect your training outcomes. And as I say, let me give you the common ones so that you've got a starting point and you've got a basis to ask questions about, well, does this apply to my dog? Is this making training more difficult or easier for my dog? The biggest thing that affects dogs' likelihood to be okay when you leave are departure cues. And I'm sure you've heard of departure cues. Departure cues are items or Uh, processes, processes, probably not the right word, items or activities or actions that happen that we do or that we involve just before we leave. The classic ones might be uh, picking up keys or putting on the coat or putting on our shoes or 
opening a door where keys are or maybe picking up our coffee mug. So things that we do before we leave that we know immediately trigger our dogs into, oh, oh, this is going to be bad. I've done another podcast episode just about these cues, so I won't repeat all that here, but I will link to that in the show notes. But just to say that these cues, these pre-departure cues, they are biggies. They do have a really big impact on the dog's response to being left, the dog's response to your training of him to be left. And that's why, and I explained it in the other podcast episode, but that's why it's really important to remove as many of them as you can from your leaving routine. Now, you might say, oh, that Julie, that's ridiculous. You know, I can't go out without my coat. Okay, yeah, if it's minus 30 outside, I get it. If it's five degrees, yeah, maybe I get that too. But because cues have such a big impact on a dog and because they often, not often, If it's triggering for your dog, then your dog is getting upset before you even think about leaving. So if picking up car keys gets your dog into a state of anxiety, you can't start absence training because your dog is already anxious. And yes, there are processes we can use if we need to, to make things like car keys or picking up a gym bag less scary. But the main thing we need to work on is your dog not being frightened of being alone. So we can remove these antecedents from our training. And if we need to, we'll add them back in. Now, that all sounds very, I don't know, um, almost like I'm talking about something that's happening in a science lab. Oh, yes, we can, you know, we've got antecedents and we'll take them out and it's just training. Well, actually, you can do this for real. I remember that we developed a way of leaving the house that did remove some of these things. If we had to put our shoes on, outside that we'd put our shoes on outside because when you have a dog with separation anxiety if I were to say to you if you put your shoes on outside your dog might be okay for two hours would you do that would you go through the inconvenience of putting your shoes on outside so that your dog could do two hours yeah of course you would you'd be like Julie where do I sign now I'm not saying that by the way I'm not saying that if you put your shoes outside your dog will get to two hours just making a point I know you know that But let's not make work for ourselves and let's not create anxiety for our dogs. If we can drop things from our leaving routine, even if we have to drop them forever, let's do it. Because all we're doing is increasing the likelihood of our dog succeeding at being left, at succeeding at the training and then ultimately succeeding at being left longer term. So I call these the cues. I I put them into what I call my what category. So they're things or actions or stuff we do. And the classic ones, there are many, but the obvious ones are things like keys and bags and purses and shoes and car keys. They can be opening and closing a cupboard where you put your coat. They can be things like I mentioned before, grabbing your water bottle or your coffee cup. They can be slamming your laptop because you always do that just before you leave. They're at that level. They're at that level of detail. They usually involve some kind of implement coupled with some kind of action. So that's why I call them the what. So for you, a little exercise for you is to think through, what does my dog respond to when I'm about to leave? Whether it's leaving for training or whether it's leaving for, you know, real life. And by the way, dogs don't know the difference between training and real life. They just know different. Those are words that we use. But let's say training versus when you used to leave your dog. Do you know what things affect your dog? We're not worried about things that don't cause an anxious reaction because they're not having an impact on your dog's likelihood to be okay. So we can forget them. If you slamming your laptop closed, your dog doesn't even notice. Your dog doesn't go, oh no, they're going out now. Then slamming your laptop is not something that we are worried about. So you only want to worry about the things that your dog worries about. And as much as you can, try dropping them from your leaving routine and then listen to the podcast that explains what else you can do. So we've got the what. My next category, because this one is very, very common in the way it affects dogs, is the when and who category. I don't have a specific statistic for you here, but the percentage of dogs that are affected by who does the training and when the training happens is sky high really high. 
let's look at when. So dogs are affected by the time of day. It can be the day of the week. I've even seen dogs who are affected by the season. So when is a very, very big factor on the dog's likelihood to succeed. So think about it for your dog. Now, what I find fascinating here is there isn't a consistent pattern. If you have a dog that does badly in the evenings, you just know when you're training in the evenings, you can't get the same duration as when you're training in the mornings. You might be led to think that all dogs struggle with training in the evenings, but the reality of it is, is it's all over the map. I've seen dogs who are fine in the evenings, bad in the mornings, fine in the mornings, bad in the evenings, afternoons are better, Saturdays are better than Wednesdays are better than weekdays in the summer and so on and so on. But the broad category there is when. Start thinking about that for your dog because it's really a massive light bulb moment and it often helps you answer the question. I just don't get it. I don't get why my dog struggled on Tuesday, but then I went to do the training today and he was fine. Is one of the things that changed the time of day you did the training? So I'd recommend as well as thinking about the classic departure cue triggers, I would definitely start getting together a list, looking back at your training exercises, comparing the time you did the training with how well your dog did and see if you can see a pattern. Once you've got that pattern, boom, then you can start training for different target durations at different times of day. And you can do, use what we call scenarios. So members of my Separation Anxiety Heroes membership club use an app that's called Be Right Back like be right back the books, but like it's called be right back. And one of the things they can do in there is they can set up different scenarios. And that allows them to do just what I explained to you there, that they can set up, a, say, an evening scenario. And if their dog does better in the evenings, what they'll be doing is they'll have a different target duration, a different trajectory, a different graph for the evenings. And then when they train in the mornings, they'll switch to the morning scenario. So when is a really big factor? Let's talk about who. I would say also, as I mentioned, is a really high percentage of dogs struggle with when. A really high percentage of dogs also struggle with who does the training and differences in who does the training. Classic differences are often two people doing the training can be harder. So if you're a family unit and two of you do the training, Many dogs find that harder than just one person doing the training, but not all dogs. Some dogs find it harder when one person does the training and easier when two people do the training. So think that one through. And when you work it out, work under the easiest conditions. And I should have mentioned that with the context of when also. Even though I encourage people to use scenarios, I also don't want you to overuse scenarios what I mean by that is if you've got a dog who does well in the morning, but struggles in the evening, does well when two of you leave, but struggles when one of you leave, I don't want you to create a million permutations. I don't know how many permutations there are for that. It was probably eight. It's probably not a million. But I don't want you to have a scenario that says both of us in the morning, both of us in the evening, one of us in the morning, one of us in the evening, the other person in the morning, that's about six, isn't it? The other person in the evening. Whoa, whoa, all over the place for the dog. Focus on the easiest context. So if one of you training in the evening is the easiest context, start there and get some really, really solid alone time under your belt, under your dog's belt, before you think about mixing up scenarios. And a good rule of thumb could be 15 minutes, ideally something like 30. Having said that, sometimes practicality plays a part too. So if you find that well, your dog does do better in the evenings when only one of you trains, but that situation almost never happens. Then you don't have to stick as tightly to that rule of don't bounce around all over the place with your scenarios. All right, so another little bit of homework for you then. Start thinking about who, combinations of who affects your dog. So who does the training? Think about that. Think about who does the training and how that affects your dog's likelihood to succeed or not all the who's there, too many who's. Okay, my final category, and this is the why. And the why is often the one that gets us scratching our head. 
What's interesting about the why is that why can make any of the other factors we've just talked about more or less problematic. The reason why the why category can be confusing and confounding is that it's not always obvious why a dog does differently well. Let me give you some examples of what I put in the why category and you'll see what I mean. So things that can affect a dog that are farther back in time include things like sleepiness, what else was going on for your dog that day, that week even, maybe other stresses that your dog has been responding to. It could be things like a trip to the groomer, a day in daycare, it could be routine changes, it could be breaks in training. It could be more play, less play, more tired, less tired. I'm going to say it again, every dog is different here. Some dogs train better when they're sleepy. Some dogs train better when they're alert. Some dogs train better after a day at daycare. Some dogs train worse. But think about those things that if you go back through a dog's day, through the day before, through the day before, seem to have a pattern in affecting your dog's likelihood to do well or not. Because that will help you answer the question, why? Why did my dog do differently well today? We trained at the time that I know is right for him, his best time. I dropped all the cues and I did the training because he does better when I do the training, but he still did badly. If you go back through your why category, you might find an answer. You might start to see that your dog does badly when they go to daycare on a Tuesday and you train on a Thursday. That might be it. Or it might be the other way. When your dog's had a day at daycare that week, maybe your dog does better. The thing about the why category is, as well is that sometimes we can work out why, but sometimes, and this is the maddening thing, sometimes we don't work out why. We can scratch our heads and look for these factors, but sometimes those factors can be internal to the dog and they aren't things that are affecting the dog externally. So we don't always see. They can be things like dogs sat being saturated with learning. They're just their brains are just going, whoa, I am just, no, I can't take any more learning. And their brains just regress to old ways of thinking, old associations. So as much as it's great to try and find out why, don't drive yourself crazy doing that. Sometimes we have to accept that there isn't always a why, no matter how hard we look for it. Okay, so a really quick summary. I've thrown a lot of stuff at you today. We're trying to answer the question, does this make training more or less likely to succeed for my dog? And if so, you want to work with those factors. You want to think about how you're going to accommodate or omit those factors from your training. Every dog is very different, but I've given you some broad categories so that at least you can then start to think about any patterns that fall into those categories. And once you start to work out what makes your dog more likely to succeed and what makes your dog less likely to succeed, you absolutely want to play to strengths. So always try to think about training at times when your dog's likely to do well. Train with the parameters, the combination of people or who does the training that's likely to make your dog do well. Dropping those cues because we know that makes it harder for dogs. Always thinking how do I make this better or worse for my dog? How do I make my dog succeed? And if you do that, you've just answered, yeah, like I said, probably the most important question when it comes to approaching a training session for separation anxiety. I hope you found this episode useful. Thank you again for tuning in. I know you've got many choices when it comes to podcast listening, but I appreciate you listening to mine. So, that's it from me for now. I'll catch you on the next one. Bye for now. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Be Right Back Separation Anxiety Podcast. If you want to find out more about how I can help you further, head over to julienaysmith.com. Meanwhile, if you enjoyed listening today, I would love it if you would head over to wherever you listen to your podcast and consider rating my show. Thanks so much. Good luck with that training and bye for now.